right, well, this is Tanner Dykin once again, uh, doing another one of these uh, right on the uh, heels of the last one. And uh, uh, we're just going to look at the uh, what is what is left of the debate. And uh, mostly what I want to look at is his um, first rebuttal uh, from the second night uh, at this time. Uh, there's there's not too much in the, the closing statement that I, I feel needs to be um you know that I that I need to go over and uh, and say much about. Most of it is just restating what was already addressed, uh, either in the debate or in this uh, video series. And uh, so uh, I'll just go ahead and, and mostly just do what he uh, what he says in his uh, rebuttal on the second night. And uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, make sure that I've got everything going here. And uh, we'll uh, just watch what he has to say. Don't think Tanner understands our position on baptism. He makes the statement that whether the physical act of baptism or being baptized confers any necessary saving grace. That's not what that's not what we believe at all. That's not what we teach. Uh, we believe that saving faith and obedience to the the conditions that God has set forth is uh, the means of receiving saving grace. And that would include faith in Jesus as commanded by God, repentance of sins as commanded by God, c confession of Jesus Christ as Lord as commanded by God, and then submitting to God in the passive act of baptism to receive the remission of our sins. Moreover, I don't know anyone that denies that baptism is a symbol or a likeness or that there is symbolism attached to it. The question is, does symbolism preclude any necessity? In other words, if it's a symbol, does that mean it can't be a necessity if it's a symbol, for example? All right, I'm just going to, uh, I'll pause it right there. And, uh, you know, he, he makes a claim there that I'm misunderstanding what he, uh, what his position is, uh, that I'm misunderstanding by saying that, that, that baptism is uh, an, the occasion at which a person uh, receives the remission of sins or, or that it's a, a means of saving grace. And, um, he, he essentially just says, he just states um, that I've misunderstood, and he doesn't explain how it is that I've misunderstood, at least not explicitly that I can, I can discern. And if, he, if he's implying a way that I've misunderstood it, I, I, can't really, um, I can't really discern what that is that he's getting at. Um, I, I would have liked it if he had, if, if he was... Uh, he believed that I, I uh, you know, genuinely did misunderstand. I would have liked it if he had taken more time um, in his, uh, you know, rebuttal um, to to really pull that out and, and and show how it is that I'm misunderstanding and do it so in in, in explicit terms. Because if if we're going to be discussing it, I need to know if I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. Um, but I, I'm not sure if if that's really the case um i think that since he he really was very brief about saying that that i misunderstood and since he really didn't didn't go into detail about it and since for the rest of his time he's trying to um he, he's trying to deal with my objections to his position and and the, the positive elements of my position um it seems to me that nonetheless I understand it enough in order to interact with it. Uh, even if I made a clumsy, you know, wording, I'm not sure if that might have been it. And if that's the case, then, uh, you know, Todd, I, I do apologize for that. And uh, you, you can send me um, how it is that you think I've, I've misunderstood. And, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll try and, and, and work toward a better understanding of it. Um, but, it, again, it seems to me that since there uh, is some um, uh, resistance there's quite a bit of resistance to what I was saying on Todd's part uh, it seems that I understand the position enough to, uh, to to bring up some valid objections um, or at least some objections that connect and so I, I don't think that this is uh, uh, you know him just saying that I, I misunderstand it is is enough to to, to really help him too much in this discussion. Uh, but now he's going to go on and, and talk about whether circumcision, I'll back it up a little, whether circumcision is necessary. Does symbolism preclude any necessity? 
In other words, if it's a symbol, does that mean it can't be a necessity if it's a symbol? For example, was, was circumcision a necessity? Or was it just a symbol? And then he used... Now, here is a, a, just a little statement that we can hold on to for a moment for something that he says in a minute. He asks, was circumcision a necessity or was it merely a symbol? He says something you know, like that. And uh, it's, it's important that, that he is kind of implying that circumcision was a necessity. And uh, okay, we'll see here in just a moment. Uh, something else he says example of, of the priests and the washing of the priests. Well, let me ask a question Was the washing of the priests a symbol and if it was was it necessary? In other words, did one of those did those Levites have to submit to the washing in order to serve in their place as a priest? And the answer is yes, they did they have to serve they had or they had to be washed as it was symbolic But it was necessary in order to serve in, in the priesthood No, all right um, he, he brings up about priestly ordination and he says it was necessary for the priests uh, to be baptized in order to serve their priestly roles in the temple. I completely agree. Uh, there's, you know, uh, this is their ordination. If they do not uh, go through their ordination, they cannot begin to do their duties as priests. But the question is, was Bap was priestly ordination baptism was it necessary for their salvation did they have to be baptized in order to be saved and the answer is patently no they didn't have to be baptized they did in order to serve in the temple that they had to in order to enter into this uh, sacred space but they did not have to in order to be uh, in order to be saved or in order to even to benefit from the uh, priestly work that went on in uh, the temple uh, and this is this is very plain by uh, the, the fact that only the Levites were uh, baptized under the old covenant um, and all of the other uh, you know tribes were not they were not um, they were not ordained as priests uh, and so you know they they were not ordained as priests and yet the the work that went on in the sanctuary was also on their behalf and so um and so it's it's you know it is a necessity for uh you know for service but not for uh salvation and i would even go so far as to say that if somebody is not baptized now you know if they're not baptized uh, as believers now then they should not be received into uh into the local church in order to serve in it um they need to be baptized in order to to, to serve in the local church because that's their ordination that, that, that they're skipping out on um they need to be baptized and so uh you know there's just a little bit about that you said and but also no one has ever said that circumcision brings forgiveness but jesus said baptism brings forgiveness uh, uh again i'll just you know uh, i'll mention uh this is why i i said to remember that statement from earlier that he asked the question whether uh circumcision was uh necessary you know whether it was uh it was needful in the old testament in in sort of implying uh, that it was it was necessary for um you know for salvation or or for blessing or whatever um and here he's saying and it seems that he's contradicting himself a little here uh that no one has ever said that circumcision uh, uh was for the uh forgiveness of sins uh, that it that, that it anything uh like that and uh, i didn't i didn't go so far as to say that it was uh, you know, uh, something that needed to happen in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. Of course, I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't say that. But I did say that it was associated with the forgiveness of sins as a symbol. Uh, you know, Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. And so it did not confer the, the forgiveness of sins, but it was associated with it. And it was a symbol of the forgiveness of sins. Of course, we, we read in Romans 4 that uh, Abraham was circumcised as a sign and a seal of the righteousness which he had uh, 
of the faith, uh, being yet uncircumcised. Uh, and in Jeremiah 4, verse 4, we read, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. And so here we have circumcision, the removal of the foreskin of the heart, you know, using circumcision as a symbol, uh, as a way of talking about uh, this this inner change, uh, that that it is it is used as a symbol for the removal of sin, uh, and, and specifically the removal of your sinful ways, the sinful evil doings of the people, and, and there we have circumcision associated with uh, the forgiveness of sins. Same in the New Testament in Romans chapter 4. And so, you know, him saying that uh, doesn't uh, change the fact that, that, that it is so in the scripture. And there is an analogy there to be made between baptism and circumcision in, the, in that they are both signs. Uh, that, that, you know, baptism symbolizes the forgiveness of sins and it symbolizes conversion to Christ in the same way that circumcision did. That it, it uh, symbolized the removing of evil from a person and the uh, sealing of a person to God. And uh, I think that that's a, a good biblical analogy to use. Uh, and even a, an analogy which, which uh, the scripture itself uses and, and, and lends to the, the topic of baptism, uh, as we read in Colossians. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there we go. Uh, let's listen to what he has to say next. I likened baptism to circumcision, and Paul likened baptism to circumcision, but that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that there, are no there are no conditions or, or no blessings attached to it. And so, you know, no one ever said baptism, or excuse me, circumcision, brings remission of sins. But Jesus said baptism brings the remission of sins. Jesus said baptism brings salvation. Jesus said baptism brings discipleship. I mean, if we're going to dismiss something just simply on the basis of it being a symbol, then I want to ask about the serpent. Was the serpent symbolic of anything? And and if so, was there, was there no substance to, to their faith because they believed God and obeyed God when they looked at that symbolic thing? And so when we submit to baptism, we are submitting to God. And our faith is not in the act of baptism. Our faith is in God who said, when you are baptized, I will cleanse you of your sins. Okay, um, he asks um, whether I believe that simply because something is a symbol that it's unimportant or, or that it, 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 you know, it's, it's in some way irrelevant. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, of course, you know, it being a symbol, a symbol symbolizes something, right? And a symbol has importance because of what it symbolizes. Right. Um, in the, the case of, of Revelation that he brings up, um, there are symbols in Revelation that, that are that are really not to be taken uh, in a hyper literal way, in, in, in a sort of solid way. Uh, but does that mean that those symbols do not represent something that's important? Of course, they represent something important. Uh, of course, they, uh, you know, they represent the way that God is going to work toward the world um, in uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we, we know that Jesus is not, uh, is not literally a lamb. He's not literally an animal. We know that he's not literally a lion. But those things do represent a, a true reality that Jesus Christ gave his life for his people, that Jesus Christ presides over his people as a king. And, uh, you know, those symbols do have importance, uh, but not because of the symbols themselves, right? It's because of the substance behind those symbols. Um, and that's what baptism is. It is important, but it is a symbol. And we should understand it as a, uh, as a symbol. And, uh, you know, so, so there we, there we have that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here. And, uh, he makes, uh, an argument that I want to, want to get to, um, or he makes a statement that I want to get to. Well, he said, sola theta implies baptism is a mere symbol. Now this is a common fallacy, which is known as begging the question. 
In other words, he assumes that sola fide is correct, even though he spent all last night trying to prove it and he didn't do it. And so he just argues from sola fide, even though it's not been established as being true. In fact, it's false. And so I'm not going to allow him to beg the question and argue uh, from sola fide that uh, that sola fide implies baptism is a mere symbol. And so. All right. Um, so he, he says that that when I brought up sola fide, faith alone, as an argument against the idea of baptismal regeneration or, or baptismal, you know, however he wants to to parse that out, that baptism is necessary for salvation. It's necessary for us to to submit to baptism in order to be saved. He says that I was begging the question uh, when I did that. I don't know if if I don't know you know, whether Todd just didn't hear what I said. I think he did hear what I said. Um, but I did give arguments. Uh, begging the question is is not, uh, you know, a, a, a fallacy about, um, uh, you know, that, that my arguments just are not, uh, uh, they're, they're not convincing to Todd, you know. Uh, th that's not committing the uh the fallacy here um to to commit the fallacy of begging the question would be to simply state sola fide is true and then build an argument off of that without you know giving some reason for thinking that sola fide is true and i did give some reason and he did not interact with those reasons he, he didn't do that uh, interact with them sufficiently at all um i gave three passages of scripture in the the second night of the debate if you go back and you listen to my opening statement and you you see where i i'm giving a, an abridged case for sola fide based off of the same passages i looked at on the first night um you'll notice that i did give reasons now he can interact with those reasons and he can he can say that he disagrees with those reasons but he cannot say that I was begging the question because I did give what I believe to be compelling arguments for faith alone. Uh, and so it, he is calling this logical fallacy where there is none to, to be called out. Um, and so I just I just kind of wanted to mention that briefly uh, because I did give arguments and. In all honesty, if you go back and you watch the debate, I brought up points about the passages of Scripture that I looked at that Todd simply did not touch in either nights of the debate. Now, that you know does not necessarily mean that those are sound arguments, but it just means that Todd did not address them. And if if he's going to claim that I did not uh, prove uh, uh, sola fide, well, he ought to address those arguments he ought to have done it before he claimed victory um and i think that 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 would have been preferable so uh with that we'll we'll move on to uh you know a, another section here that I, I wanted to look at we've not got too much uh more to go here obedient faith that brought to fruition brought to pass that text there in genesis 15 and verse number six. Again, Tanner makes mention of, of the, the priesthood and the ordinance of washing. But again, it was a necessity. It was required. It was symbolic. And yet it was required. Now, again, I'm going to ask, it was necessary for what? Priestly ordination in the Old Testament was necessary for what? Did a person have to be uh, ordained as a priest in order to, uh, you know, benefit from the work that was done in the sanctuary no they did not did they have to be ordained as a priest in order to be counted among the elect in order to be a saint of course they didn't most of the uh the saints that we see in the old testament were not levites uh, most of the priests or um, um, not the priests but most of the prophets were not levites um most of the well, the kings, uh, definitely of the southern kingdom, were not Levites, uh, and and so, uh, you know, what we have is uh, that it was it was not uh, necessary to be a priest to be ordained as a priest to be 
saved. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we see in the scripture. Um, and he's not dealing with that, uh, that reality. Um, and again, if he's going to say that it is necessary for a person to uh, be baptized in order to be saved, in order to be forgiven of their sins, since baptism is an Old Testament practice taken from the law, he is essentially saying that we are justified by law. And Paul has a lot to say about this. Uh, it's, it's like saying that we need to add something to the priestly work that Christ did. And that just does not, that just not sit well with uh, New Testament biblical theology. I'd like to look at Galatians 3, uh, 27 for a moment and make just a few comments on uh, a few things that Todd is going to say here. No reason understanding why he mentioned Galatians 3, 27, because that passage says we are baptized into Christ. In verse 26, it says, for as many of you as, as uh, 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 that you are all the sons of God, by the faith which is in Christ Jesus. For, this is the explanation, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're made the sons of God through faith when we are baptized into Christ. And then, all right. Uh, so he, he says that he's not sure why. I went to Galatians 3.27, and uh, he said he tries to give an argument for why baptism here should be taken as the occasion of our uh, being made children of God. Um, I disagree with with, of course, both statements. I did go to Galatians 3.27 for a reason. Uh, it was to show that New Testament baptism is Old Testament priestly ordination. Uh, and that's shown by the parallel uh, uh, way that the, the, uh, the rite is talked about in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the priests uh, would be brought to the temple uh, to the tabernacle, they would be brought to the laver of water, they would be given a bath, and the the connotation is that they would be immersed in that water to take uh, their bath, and then they would be, uh, they would have the garments brought to them, and they would put on the priestly garments. And in verse 23 of Galatians 3, we have, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, that is, washed in the name of Christ, have put on Christ, and it, it is as a garment, as, as the priestly garments. Uh, and so here we have the an abridged version of the priestly ordination rite. Well, he, he says that verse 27 is an explanation of verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he says that the explanation for how it is that they are the children of God by faith is that they've been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Uh, that's not what the passage is saying at all. Uh, that's that's uh, not going back far enough in the context. The, the actual um, uh, thing that's being explained here is not verse 26, but verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. That statement that we are no longer under a schoolmaster, meaning the law. We're no longer under the law. We're as as a, it being our schoolmaster. We have grown out of it. We have we have reached our maturity, and now we've grown out of the law being our schoolmaster. For it says, "Ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ." That is how we have, have grown at one way, that we've grown out uh, into maturity and are no longer under the schoolmaster. But another reason that's given, parallel to being the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, is that we have been ordained as priests. Verse 27, for as many of you has, have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So, not only have we been brought to be children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, but we have also been baptized. So, so not only have we grown out and, and, and become the children of God, but we have been initiated also into a new priesthood in Jesus Christ. So the old priesthood, the old schoolmaster, the old law is no longer 
our schoolmaster. It no longer is is over us to to discipline us to to uh, um, uh, to to keep us uh, you know down and and to uh, to be an occasion for our uh, judgment. But rather, now we are the children of God by faith. We, we are his children. We are not under the schoolmaster. We've been brought into the inheritance. And we have been made priests in a new system of priesthood. Uh, that is under Jesus Christ. And so these are two parallel reasons. They're not building off, or they're, they're not uh, explaining one another. They are two separate things ex, uh, explaining uh, two different levels of how it is that we are no longer under the schoolmaster. And so um, that's why I brought up Galatians 3.27. I, I, of course, didn't bring all of that out in the debate, but it's, it's plain in the text. Now let's look at another, um, another statement he makes here. ...have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We're made the sons of God through faith when we are baptized into Christ. Christ. And then and then he makes mention of John's baptism being borrowed from the proselyte baptism. Now, what he's going to have to do is show me one single verse from the Old Testament that shows proselyte baptism. In fact, there is no evidence that proselyte baptism was even practiced before John and Jesus came on the scene. Okay, um, so uh, he says that uh, I brought up proselyte baptism in the debate um i said in the debate i did no such thing you know i this objection in a in a sense is not um the, the force is not felt because i didn't build any of my arguments off of uh proselyte baptism it was on levitical baptism priestly baptism and uh you know so his uh you know getting worked up about uh proselyte baptism doesn't really do much um, but I, I would just sort of make a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, just, just a little uh, pointer uh, that, that, that maybe we do have a, a kind of proselyte baptism under the Old Testament, and that's in the baptism of Naaman the leper under Elisha the prophet, uh, that Naaman was told to go and wash in Jordan and be cleansed of his leprosy, and he does this, and afterward he immediately begins to worship Yahweh. He begins to worship God. In fact, he wants to take some dirt back to his home from Israel so that he can build an altar on it so that he could, in, in a kind of spiritual sense, say, well, he is worshiping uh, at Israel. You know, he's, he's worshiping the God of Israel because of this, um, this bag of dirt that he brought back from Israel. And, uh, you know, so there might be uh, a kind of Old Testament uh, basis or an Old Testament uh, occurrence of proselyte baptism. But again, this doesn't really uh, make much of a difference to the argument. It, we see that, uh, you know, that uh, priestly baptism was under the Old Covenant. It was a part of the law. It is what New Testament baptism is. Uh, it was brought into the New Testament through John who was the son of a priest, who himself uh, would have been uh, in the priesthood. He would have been, uh, by his lineage, ordained as a priest. And he begins to ordain in the wilderness, and he ordains Jesus Christ. Um, and Jesus Christ, as John decreased, Jesus took his rightful place at the head of uh, his people, and he began to teach his disciples to baptize. And that's where... A New Testament baptism comes from. So, uh, you know, there we have it. And he makes a, another statement here in just a, a moment that that kind of um, it, it it kind of got to me a, a little bit. That um, you know, Todd got a little bit worked up about it, and and uh, when he said it, I got a little uh, worked up about it. Uh, and it's mostly because that again, the objection does not really connect because of of where I'm, uh, where the, the, the scripture shows us where baptism comes from. At the end of the New Testament, I'm going to ask Tanner this question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? God or man? 
That's the question Jesus asked those in, in Matthew 21 and verse 24 when, when they would claim to be ma the masters of authority. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Heaven or man? And they would not answer because they knew it came from heaven. John did not borrow that baptism. He even said himself that God sent him to baptize in John chapter 1 and verse number 24. God sent John to baptize. And Jesus was obligated to, to obey that baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus wasn't obeying something that John borrowed from so-called proselyte baptism. Tanner, answer me that question. John's baptism from heaven or from men? Uh, the, the testimony of the text and, and, and the scholarship of, of, of others says that, uh, that there was no such thing as proselyte baptism. All right. So where, where did it come from? Exodus 29, 4. Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the congregation, uh, the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall wash them with water, and thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron. They were to be brought before the, con the tabernacle of the congregation, baptized, and put on the priestly garments. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is where priestly ordination baptism uh, connects with New Testament baptism. The baptism of John, it was of God. It came from the law that God gave. It came by the, the movement of the Spirit on John to begin to baptize the people because God had called the people to be a kingdom of priests. And this is, of course, the same practice which is practiced with believers uh, after the ascension of Christ. And so... Uh, that's where uh, this baptism came from. Before, uh, before this, then Tanner goes to Acts 10, 44 to 48. And again, what he fails, what he fails to note is verse 48. That after this incident, uh, that the account of Peter preaching to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And Pe as Peter described, as it did on us at the beginning. In other words, whatever happened to Peter and the apostles in Acts 2 is the exact same thing that happened in Acts 10. He, he described it in such language in Acts 11 and in Acts 15. And so after the Holy Spirit fell as a sign to Peter that the Gentiles were the recipients of the gospel of the gospel dispensation, it says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Again, which baptism is that? The baptism of Jesus. What baptism is that? The baptism that brings discipleship. The baptism that brings salvation, Mark 16. The baptism that brings remission of sins, Luke 24 and Acts 2 and verse 38. Tanner says they were converted before they were baptized. If that be the case, they were converted before they were baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. And that just that just simply will not hold any water. And then last. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he, he objects to my use of Cornelius and his house uh, and the fact that they did receive the sign of the Holy Ghost before they uh, were baptized. That is the, the sign of the, the seal of uh, the righteousness, uh, which is by faith. Right. Um that, that they were shown by the Holy Spirit to be truly converted to Christ um, before they were baptized. He objects to this because he says that I stopped before verse 48. I did not stop before verse 48. I read verse 48 because uh, the, the, the argument doesn't make much sense unless after they had received the Holy Ghost, they were baptized. And, and it's very specific, very explicit, uh, that, that they received the Holy Ghost, they received the gifts that the Holy Ghost confers, and then Peter says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They were baptized after they received the Holy Ghost. And uh, his little statement uh, about, well, they if they were converted, uh, well, how does he say it here? Uh, Remission of sins, Luke 24 and Acts 2 and verse 38. Tanner says they were converted before they were baptized. If that be the case, they were converted before they were baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. And that just, that just simply will not hold any water. And then lastly... Well, that, you know, he says... Uh, they were converted before they received baptism in the name of the Lord. Yes, that's that's what I'm saying, uh, because I'm not bringing a 
baptismal theology, a, a, a baptismal regeneration theology, a theology that says that you must be baptized before you're converted to Christ. I'm not bringing that to the text. I'm just letting the text speak for itself. We have laid out for us exactly what happened. They were converted, they received the Holy Ghost, and after that, they were baptized. Um, we know that the Holy Ghost is the seal of the redemption that's in Christ. We, we read about this in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we know that, that he is the the earnest of the purchased inheritance, right? Uh, that, that, that he is the one that uh, bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God in Romans chapter 8. The, the spirit and his presence uh, in somebody, right? And, and, and especially in the book of Acts, uh, the, the, the presence of the spirit is the, the saving power of God. If the Spirit is on somebody, it means that they are saved in the book of Acts. And uh, that's what we see in, in Acts 10. Um, and so, uh, you know, there we, there we have that. Uh, just a statement of incredulity, not really an argument being given. The universal nature of Holy Spirit baptism. So I'm going to ask him. Does what happens today, is what happened to Tanner when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it like what happened in Acts 2, 1 to 4? Tanner, did you speak in tongues? Did you speak in a language that you had never studied before and, 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 and preach to people in a language you'd never studied before? Did, did you do like the Gentiles when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in, in Acts 10? And, and, and they began to speak in other tongues and glorify God? If, the, if there's a universal nature of Holy Spirit baptism, then whatever happened in Acts 2, and whatever happened in Acts 10, which are the same thing, has to happen today. And you know that is not true. And so with that, uh, I believe I've answered most of his arguments and my time is almost gone. So I will uh, turn it back over to Ben at this time. All right. So uh, there is uh, the last argument that I, I want to, to really look at tonight. Um, and uh, the argument is essentially that, that he says, uh, if Holy Spirit baptism is a universal feature of the church that every person that is converted to Christ receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then uh, he he says it must be that, that uh, you experience what happened on the day of Pentecost, that, that the, the Spirit came down, you know, with cloven tongues of fire, uh, that you speak with other tongues, that you prophesy, you do all of these uh, ecstatic uh, you know, gifts, these charismatic gifts. And, uh, you know, he, he says, Tanner, have you uh, preached in a language that you have never studied? And, uh, you know, I notice that when he says this, again, a statement of incredulity that he doesn't believe it, you notice that he did not address the text of Scripture that I brought up to, to show, to demonstrate that Holy Spirit baptism is universal to the body of Christ. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, verse 13, uh, there's a little, um, you know, note that we should, we should uh, take note of here. Um, in verse 13, it says uh, in the King James, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with the, the rendering of the King James here, uh, but the sense of the, the, the text is that the spirit is that which we are baptized in. It's, it's not talking about water baptism. It, it, it is uh, it is something more you know sort of like uh, for in one spirit are we all baptized into one body it is the baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, is being talked about here and you'll notice that it's being talked about as universal to the body for you know for as the body is one and hath many many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ. 
For in one spirit are we all baptized into one body. All of us, we are all baptized in the Holy Spirit. It, it, we all have Holy Spirit baptism. So it's not enough to just go to Acts and, and see some things that happened on the first day when the Holy Spirit was poured out and say, well, your, your baptism in the Holy Spirit must look like that. Otherwise, it's not Holy Spirit baptism. Therefore, Holy Spirit baptism is not universal because we don't all experience that. Well, uh, he needs to deal with what this text actually says, and he did not do that. I have an accounting for why the baptism of the Holy Spirit looked differently in Acts chapter 2 than it, did, uh, than it does today. And that is actually given in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Uh, if we look in verse 4 uh, through 11, uh, we read, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there is, are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are differences of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The, the, this is, of course, the gifting of the Spirit, the various gifts that he gives to uh, his people. And it says that while it is the one same Spirit and the one same baptism of the Spirit, nonetheless, there are different gifts that the Spirit gives to different people. And he can choose as I believe he has, and, and I hope everybody that's listening to this thinks he has, he can choose to no longer give the charismatic gifts as they were given in the first century. He has the sovereignty to do that. But it is still the same spirit. It is still the same baptism in the spirit that happens today as it happened in Acts chapter 2, as it happened in Acts chapter 10. Uh, it is the one spirit who works according to his will, he uh, divides to every man severally as he wills, and to us he has not chose, uh, chosen to give the gift of tongues or interpretation of tongues or prophecies. Uh, it is according to his sovereign will. And we can also look down in verse 27 uh, of the chapter. Now ye are the body of Christ. Again, the same body language and members in particular. And God hath set in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then he goes, of course, into the, uh, into the passage about love, and how love is a gift given by the Spirit, and how love is better than all of these gifts that are talked about here. And that love abides. That love is given by the Spirit. In fact, it is a manifestation of the same spirit baptism that we see in the book of Acts. And so, you know, to end off, this is the last, um, this is the last point that I want to make, uh, you know, about this debate. Uh, to, to leave off here, um, I just want us to see that, that the spirit, the self-same spirit, the one spirit that works, gives to all according to his will. He has chosen to give some in the first century the gift of tongues. He's chosen to give some of them the gift of prophecy. He's chosen to make some of them apostles of Jesus Christ. And today he has chosen to make some teachers and some pastors and some uh, 
to give the gift of helps and some to give the uh, tenacity to be able to raise children. And he's given all of these things according to his own will. But the one thing that remains constant is that he is the spirit of love. And if we have love among us, if the church has this bond of charity that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13, then we know that we have the baptism of the Spirit on us. And I just want us to all take that away from this. I know I'm getting maybe a little sappy here at the moment, uh, but it's in the scripture and it's something that we all need to hear. We all need to be charitable to one another. Uh, we all need to continue in the love of Christ uh, and uh, know that when we do that, it's only because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us and uh, we will know each other by the fruits of charity that are born out. And uh, so with that, I hope that this has been helpful to some. Uh, it's uh, uncertain about uh, what is in store in the future for uh, any, um, you know, any more interactions with uh, Church of Christ, uh, you know, representatives. Um, but uh, I'm open to it, just not quite at the moment. It gets kind of exhausting, uh, you know, to, to do this kind of stuff. Uh, but we'll see if, if in the future maybe we can we can do some uh, more stuff uh, with them or just some content about their uh, doctrine. And so with that, uh, this is Tanner Dyken once again uh, signing out and uh, God bless.